Hi class, welcome to the next video in chapter 6. This is section 6.3. Today we're going to talk about the second derivative. Now, we've talked about the second derivative in so far as I've told you you can take more than one derivative. So we've calculated the second derivative a couple of times, but we haven't talked about its use. We talked about what the second derivative is used for in physics a little bit. I said that if our original function is position, then the first derivative is velocity and the second derivative is acceleration, which is extremely, extremely important. Although that's not the focus of this section. So in this section, we're going to talk about what the second derivative is and how we can actually use it to our benefit when we're analyzing a function. So remember that the first derivative talks about the slope of the tangent line of our function right it's the instantaneous rate of change the second derivative is the instantaneous rate of change of our first derivative right which makes sense but how does the second derivative relate to our original function especially if our original function doesn't tell us position right if it's not an application of physics if it's just a function that we're dealing with so <clears throat> there's um before we get into that we're going to talk about the different notations We've gone over a few of them um, as we've gone through this class. We've gone through the Leibniz notation. We've gone, you know, I've told you the different notations, but we haven't really specifically gone into the notation for higher order derivatives. I did tell you that when we're using the prime notation that once we get past the third derivative, we stop using the, the apostrophes, the tick marks, and we just start saying, you know, in parentheses, we put the value. Right, the fourth derivative would be f in parentheses four as a, a superscript, and then our our function input x or t. Right, so that's all fine and dandy. But what about the Leibniz notation? What about the other notations that we have? So there's other ways of classifying a derivative. So we're going to go over those as well and how to notate the higher order derivatives. Right. So here, one, two, three, four, up to n is what we're going to use for our derivative. So our first derivative, second derivative, third, fourth. Here we'll just classify this as the nth derivative, right? So it could be the sixth, the twelfth, the hundred and seventh. It doesn't matter. It's the whatever value we choose for n. So notice again, when we're using our prime notation, once we get past the third derivative, we, we don't just write, you know, a million prime marks. We notate it in parentheses in the superscript. Uh, same thing if we're using y, right? So interchangeably we use f prime of x or we'll say y prime. So same thing when I'm doing higher order derivatives of uh, y as my function, I do the same thing after the third derivative, I start putting in parentheses four. Notice that the parentheses helps me to understand that I'm not doing y to the fourth power, right? That since it's in parentheses and it's just um, an integer here, then I'm using this as the derivative. It's the fourth derivative of y. Okay. When we use the Leibniz notation, we have our dy dx. For the second, third, fourth, and nth, it's pretty straightforward. Here, the d in the differential dy gets the square cube for or nth power. And in the denominator, the uh, input variable, x or t or whatever it is that we have, gets the squared or cube or the nth degree uh, uh, power assigned to it. So it's a little bit different. It's not dy to the third. It would be d cubed over y over dx cubed. Okay, so it's a little different. Um, technically speaking, this, uh, this x cubed here, it's really the whole differential dx that is being cubed. We just don't write it under in parentheses. Okay, um, here I guess it skips down to two of them. So when we have the notation where I'm putting the function inside of a parentheses, the function inside of the parentheses stays the same, which is, you can really see uh, why that's happening from the notation above it where the y in the numerator stays left alone every single time. And it's the d over dx, right? The d over dx here is what's being cubed. The d over dx here is what's being cubed. It's this whole thing cubed, which notates which derivative, which is y. Uh, these middle two notations here, they're identical. It's just am I writing f of x with my uh, numerator or am I writing it off to the side? Okay. Here, this is the subscript notation. This is kind of reserved for 
higher higher level mathematics once you get into like calculus three uh differential equations things like that we start taking derivatives as subscripts like this because um we'll start having what are called multivariable functions where we're not just using x as an input but maybe x and y or x and y and z or uh theta phi and t right so there's all once we get in calc 3 we have multiple variables inside and so this subscript notation tells us the order that we use for derivatives so um, this one you won't see until a higher level order or a higher level class than this one okay same here we're using d as the uh, derivative operator okay which you won't see for a much 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 higher level math class than calculus um, calculus 1 2 or 3 you won't see this You'll see this in Diffy Q if you get that far, um, if that's your projected route. Um, but generally, higher level mathematicians will start to use this uh, linear operator notation. Okay, so <clears throat> again, uh, just to prefix this, the first four are probably the ones that you're going to see the most. F prime, Y prime, DY, DX, D, DX, and then your function on the inside, right? So again, just like the first derivative, the second derivative allows us to analyze our function and it has a special relationship to f of x, okay? So if f of x is a position function, um, then we know about its special relationship. It, the second derivative is the acceleration, right? So our first derivative, f prime of x, tells us how our function is changing. The second derivative tells us how the first derivative is changing, right? The third derivative, tells us how the second derivative is changing and so forth and so forth, right? So that, that should all make sense because the next derivative just tells you how the previous one is changing. It's, you know, if your fourth derivative is positive, then it means your third derivative is increasing, right? And if your third derivative is increasing, then that means that your second derivative is uh, increasing, right? And if that one is positive, then that means that your first one is increasing as well. So it's kind of a, a pattern if you will right we're gonna focus on just just getting to the second derivative and what that means for our function right so if our second derivative is positive then my first derivative is increasing in value okay it doesn't necessarily mean that the first derivative is positive it just means it's increasing in value so my first derivative can be negative but it's getting less negative and moving towards a positive direction that's a possibility right so again it can still be negative but it's becoming less negative, right? What that means for my function is that, so again, think about this, right? F prime of X is how fast my function is changing. So if the rate at which my function is changing is changing, right? Then that signifies to me that there is curvature going on in my original function. So when my second derivative is positive, it means my original function is concave up, meaning that I am bowl-like in nature, right? If I poured water into my function on top of it from on top, it would fill up like a swimming pool, right? Concave up. If the second derivative is negative, okay, then my first derivative is decreasing. Again, it can still be positive, but it is becoming less positive, right? So if the second derivative is negative, then that means that my original function is, you guessed it, concave down. Okay, The rate of change for my function is becoming slower, right? It's decreasing in value. So um, if the second derivative is zero, then we have what's called a possible, possible inflection point, right? An inflection point is a point where my function changes from being concave up to being concave down or vice versa if it was already concave up the exact moment when it changes from going concave um i'm sorry let's switch that around from going concave down to being concave up that is an inflection point so it doesn't matter as whenever i'm changing from one to the other is an inflection point so here this is a portion where i'm concave down here this is a portion where i'm concave up the inflection point is the point where I go from being a hill to now becoming a valley, right, or bowl. 
let's think about this in terms of rates of change. My function is decreasing here, right? So that means that my first derivative is negative, okay? But look at how my function is changing. Here, from this point to this point, there's not a big difference in change, right? If I look at the same interval over here, there's a drastic increase in change, which means my function is becoming more and more negative, right? The derivative is becoming negative at a faster and faster pace as I approach this value, okay? So when my uh, first derivative is negative, or it's decreasing, that means that I'm concave down, right? My second derivative then, which tells me how my first derivative is changing, indicates to me that the rate of change in my original function is decreasing. It's slowing down. Same thing for the other side when I'm concave up, right? So think about it as a roller coaster. If I was on a roller coaster, here, when I approach this part of the hill, my rate of change isn't changing too fast. As I come down here, I'm going to have a very, very quick acceleration, right? Versus when I'm down here, my acceleration is going to be very, very slow. In fact, my acceleration is going to slow down as I come here. Now, my speed is going to increase, yeah, because I'm coming down a hill. But the rate at which my speed is changing is slower here than it is here, right? And it's changing in a negative direction, which means that my function is decreasing, right? So again, this is my inflection point. This is when my second derivative is going to be positive. I'm concave up. This is when my second derivative is going to be negative. I am concave down. So long story short, whether or not you understand this or not, it's okay to be honest with you. As long as you understand that the second derivative being negative indicates a portion where you have uh, concave down and the second derivative being positive means that your original function is concave up. That's really what I want you to take away from this right now. Okay. So if the second derivative is positive for every value inside of an interval, right, every input inside of an interval, then my function is concave up on that interval. So this is just repeating what we had before in a more rigorous uh, fashion. If the second derivative is negative for every x value inside of the closed interval from a to b, then my function is concave down on a to b. So this is the strict rigorous definition, just me rephrasing exactly what we are talking about from this graph. Okay. If the second derivative at the point c is equal to zero, then x equals c is a possible inflection point. It does not mean that it is an inflection point, but it's a possible inflection point. And again, Remember that inflection means I'm changing from concave up to concave down or from concave down to concave up. It doesn't matter which order, but the concavity is changing. It's the point for the change in concavity. This brings us to the second derivative test. So we already had the first derivative test, which talked about finding local max and min values. The second derivative test does pretty much the same thing for us, but it's a little bit more uh, precise. Um, Little, I'm not going to say it's less work. It really depends on the derivative that we're taking, but it's more accurate uh, for us to do. All right. So let's say that the second derivative is continuous near a uh, point C. Okay. We haven't classified this as an inflection point yet. We're just saying near some point C. If the derivative at C equals zero and the second derivative is positive, meaning that I have a horizontal tangent and I am concave, let's see, I'm positive now, right? It's positive, so concave up, right? So let, what do you think will be here? I have a horizontal tangent, possibly have a horizontal tangent at this point, and my concavity here is telling me that I shouldn't be concave up. That means I should be at a possible value where I have a minimum, right? Because I am concave up, right? Meaning I open upwards. And my derivative here has a uh, value of zero, right? So I have a horizontal tangent and my second derivative is positive. So concave up, horizontal tangent, right? Which means I'm at the bottom of a valley. 
So that will be a minimum, a local minimum. If my derivative is zero and my second derivative is negative, then that means that I am at the top of a hill or a local maximum at this value. If the first derivative is 0 at C and the second derivative is 0 at C, then the second derivative tells us nothing, right? It's an inconclusive test. I can't say whether or not I'm at a local max or min or an inflection point or what's going to have no information, okay? So let's do an example. Show that the inflection points of the curve y equals x times sine of x lie on the curve y squared times x squared plus 4 equals 4x squared. So let's break this down a little bit. It's kind of asking for a lot. Uh, we want to find the inflection points first and foremost for x sine of x, which means I need to find the second derivative and find all the times when the second derivative is equal to 0. So no matter what, no matter what I know that I have to do that, right? Because I have to find the inflection points for this, which means second derivative equal to 0. Once I do that, this problem is asking me to verify that those points, all of them, satisfy this equation. Meaning that if I plug in the x and the y, I'll always have equality on both sides of this uh, equation. Okay. So first and foremost, let's find the inflection points. So I needed to find the second derivative here. So my first derivative is basically just the uh, product rule. So it'll be sine of x plus uh, x times negative cosine, right? So differentiate x, leave sine alone, leaves me with just sine of x. I will add to that, um, leave x alone and differentiate sine. So the sine stays the same and I get cosine, okay? The second derivative is the same thing. Sine will turn into cosine. Here, I'll take the product rule again, okay? So this goes to cosine and the second term uh, x goes to 1, cosine stays the same, x stays the same, cosine goes to negative uh, sine. So this turns into negative 2, I'm sorry, this turns into 2 cosine minus x sine of x. I then need to set this equal to 0. Okay, that's my, that's how I find my uh, inflection points. Okay, my possible inflection points. Set it equal to 0. And solve. So now I have a uh, equation, a trigonomic equation, which means that there is generally infinite solutions, right? Because we know for sine equations, we can go around the unit circle an infinite number of times. So I'll actually end up with an infinite number of solutions here, which makes sense because it's a sine function, right? So let's set these two things equal, right? So we'll add x on the other side. I can divide both sides now by sine. So I have x is equal to 2 tangent of x. Okay. Um, or I can write an equality, right? Because I have my original equation is y equals x sine of x. So when I move this over, I really just have y equals 2 cosine of x. Okay. So if I square it, I get x squared sine squared x equals 4 cosine squared of x and look what's happening I'm starting to look like uh, my equation here right I have 4 something squared I know x and cosine are the same so that's looking pretty good um, my y squared is over here this isn't necessarily this thing yet okay but I'm working my way there so um, I'm squaring y x squared 1 minus cosine squared of y is the same as sine squared of x. So I'm going to rewrite everything in terms of cosine. And again, I know that uh, cosine is the same thing as x, right? So I have 4 cosine squared x, 1 minus cosine squared x. So I can distribute this x across. Okay. And I will then add this to the other side. So I have x squared equals 4 cosine squared of x plus x squared cosine squared x. Now I have a common cosine squared x term, which I can factor out, okay? And so here I can multiply both sides times 4. So really what I'm doing is I'm trying to get everything to look like this thing here, right? Okay. 
Okay. So I multiply everything times 4. And this I can now square. This is the same thing as 2 cosine of x being squared, which I know is y. Okay. From here. Y squared was 4 cosine squared of x. So I have my y squared, which is 4 cosine squared of x. I have x squared plus 4 equals 4x. Okay. 4x, 2 cosine squared, x squared plus 4. So this satisfies my conditions. So this uh, is equaled whenever I have the second derivative equal to 0. right? So <clears throat> this was not as using the second derivative test, but this was showing um, using the second derivative to come to this conclusion. right? So the nice thing now is that you have options when you do want to find maximum or minimums local max and minimums. You can use the first derivative test or you can use the second derivative test, but really this whole section is about the second derivative, so I chose an example where we are talking about inflection points and using the second derivative.